Hello everyone. Uh, I'd like to get started today with a, a fun little video about movement. This is something that is all around us and is very relevant to everything that uh, we're going to talk about in anatomy and physiology. And yet it's something we take for granted. Perhaps we don't understand the, the complexity behind the simpleness. Um, but that's, that's today's topic. It's, it's movement. And I'd like to just set up a quick scenario to help us understand some things that we inherently already know. So let's consider, if you will, a, let's draw a barrier. And then let's put in some black dots on this side. And we'll put in a few other black dots on that side. So we see that there are more black dots on the top than there are on the bottom, and they're separated by this barrier. Now, if I was to ask you, what would happen if we opened up a door to let these particles easily pass through? Could you predict what's going to happen? Now, as you think about that, there's a couple of terms that I want to make sure that we, we fully understand. Number one is the term gradient. If we don't understand what a gradient is, then we're going to really struggle. A gradient, simply put, is a difference in concentration across a given space. And we can see a gradient in the example that we set up where we we actually have a high concentration up here, and we'll kind of draw it like this, and a low concentration down here. So we have a concentration gradient from high to low. And this is going to help us understand what these, these molecules are going to do. Now, I'm assuming that most of you, as you look at this, can, with a high degree of confidence, tell me that these black dots from this side are going to end up moving through that door over to this side. But now I need to ask a, a simple question. Let's take, for example, let's take this guy right here. He's closest to the door. Do we know what this black dot is going to do? Likewise, do we know, let's go down here, do we know what this black dot is going to do? Is it possible that this black dot could actually move this way through the hole before anything else happens? And the answer is yes, of course it's possible. So how can we predict that there's going to be a movement of black dots from the top to the bottom? We cannot, we cannot predict the movement of any one single black dot. These are governed, the, the movements of these are governed by randomness, by random Brownian motions. And we just don't know what they're going to do. But with a high degree of confidence, we can predict a net movement from high to low. Now, how can we do that? Simple. Stochastic odds, or odds of randomness, right? When we come back and look at these black dots, let's clear this up a little bit. The odds of one of these, let's count them, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. I have 12 up here, and I have 3 down here. The odds of one of these on the top finding the door, because there's 12 of them, are simply higher than one from the bottom. Now, I'm not saying that one from the bottom couldn't go through, right? We already said it could, but the odds are less. Now, increasing the probability is the fact that on the top, because there are more particles, they are going to be running into each other a lot more often, changing direction more often. So not just because there's more, but because of the random, the, the changes in direction is going to increase significantly. Now we have a lot greater odds that one from the top will find one from the bottom. And so we do see this net movement. Now let's move, let's move some of these down here. So now we have eight on the bottom, seven on the top. Mostly, it's almost equilibrium. 
And based on stochastic odds, we get a scenario where we're at equilibrium. And so the odds of going in this direction are about the same as the odds going in the other direction. Not that movement has stopped, but there's no net movement simply because of equilibrium. So with that in mind, the basis of movement, let's see if we can better understand the types of molecular movement that we need to understand in the body. The type of movement that we were just discussing is passive. So, and as such, we're going to call it diffusion. Passive diffusion describes the movement that we just showed, a, a, a movement spontaneous, a net movement from high concentration to low concentration. So when we think about direction, right, it's especially when we're thinking about cells, too often we think, oh, it's going in or it's going out. That's not a good way to think about it. Direction for passive movement isn't in or out. It's always from high to low. Sometimes that might be in. Sometimes it might be out. But if we understand the gradient, then it's easy to understand direction. The other thing about passive diffusion is that it doesn't cost any energy. This cost is free. It happens all by itself. There's nothing that I need to do. Again, because these molecules have an inherent kinetic movement to it, this Brownian motion, there's nothing that I need to do to get them to go down their concentration gradient. They will do it spontaneously. Now, let's contrast that with another type of movement. Instead of passive, this is active. And instead of diffusion, we call this active transport. As you might guess, because it's active, we can actually go in the opposite direction. We can go from low to high. However, just like putting a canoe in a river, spontaneously it goes downstream. Can it go upstream? Yes. But with energy, I have to paddle it. I have to constantly exert force. And so this has a cost. It requires energy. But it can be done. Okay. Let's explore passive diffusion for, for just a bit. There are two types of passive diffusion. And we can list this as simple or facilitated. Both of them, again, just to be, make sure, both of these are examples of passive diffusion. In other words, both of them go in a direction from high to low and do not require energy. Well, what's the difference? The difference, if we go back to our example, is simply this. If there is a barrier in place, let's go back and build our gradient. We've got a strong gradient here on the top, high to low toward the bottom. Right now, nothing will move because these particles can't get through the barrier. Now, if, if we got rid of the wall altogether, the gradient's still there, and we can now predict our net movement in that direction. But with a barrier in place, there is no net movement. Not that there doesn't want to be, but there can't be simply because these things can't move through the barrier. So in the absence of a wall, this, this is called simple. However, if we put a wall in, in order to get movement, what do we have to do? We have to open up some sort of door right? A little tube or a channel. And this is a facilitator. It allows things that normally could not get through this barrier to go through because of this special channel. So this would be considered facilitated. So if we're talking now simple diffusion, this is like, you know, I've, I've got a pizza down the hallway. There's 
no doors that are closed. I can freely smell that and it's going to attract me, right? That's, that's an example of simple diffusion. In a cell, though, it's a little bit different because as we talked about in the previous lecture, we have this membrane, right? It's a lipid bilayer and it's a formidable barrier. So what can go through this barrier without using a door? So when we think about simple passive diffusion across a cell membrane, there are four characteristics, small, nonpolar, non-charged, and lipophilic. If a particle has all of these as characteristics, then it's able to get through the cell membrane. It just passes right through it, like there's no barrier there. So this is going to be like, you know, gases like carbon dioxide or oxygen or nitrogen, right? These are small they're nonpolar, they're non-charged, and they're lipophilic molecules. So they go right through. And this is important, for example, with gas exchange in the lung. No barriers. I don't need any help moving these things. They move by themselves. However, if I'm a little bit big, let's say glucose. Glucose is, is, is a larger molecule. Um, if I'm polar, like water, water's a polar molecule. If I'm charged, like ions, sodium ion, potassium ion, chloride, hydrogen ion, these are all charged molecules. And as such, they cannot get through that lipid bilayer that represents our cell membrane. And so in order to do that, we need a facilitator. We need doors. And those doors can be broken down into two different types channels and carriers. And there's four different channels that I want you to be aware of. Number one is a simple leak channel. A leak channel is just a tunnel, right? There's no gate on it. There's no, there's no lid, right? It's always open. It's always there. And um, it allows for the specific transport of certain molecules. It might be specific for sodium or potassium or water, as in aquaporins. Um, it might be a little bit more general, say cations, right? So now sodium and potassium and magnesium and calcium, all these cations might be able to use it. So um, specificity, it, it's specific for what needs to move, but there's no lid on it. It's always there and it's always open. So there's my leak channel. The other three channels add on to this because they are regulated when they open and close. And we have gates that are triggered. We have a ligand gated, a voltage gated, and a mechanical gated. These channels are opened and closed by these various activities. A ligand is simply a general term for something that binds to a receptor. And so a good example of this is in the brain. We've got a neurotransmitter, say serotonin or dopamine. It's released from a neuron. It travels across the synaptic cleft and binds to a ligand-gated channel. The serotonin or the dopamine, this is the ligand. So it binds to it. That causes the channel to open up. And then Ions, typically this is what they are, whatever's going to go through it will now have access to go through as long as there's a gradient in place. And I know the direction, high to low, and it doesn't cost me anything. Voltage gated works by voltage differences across the membrane. So as we talk about action potentials in a neuron, this changes the voltage of the inside of the cell. It was very negative and now it's a lot less negative. It might even become positive locally. And the change in voltage in the membrane is what triggers these gates to open and close. And then a mechanically gated channel, these are, these are on stretch receptors. So imagine a rubber band or a balloon, if you will. Um, if, if, I, if I take a balloon and I draw a line on it while it's deflated, and then I blow up that balloon, what happens to the marker line that I drew? It expands, it gets bigger. But you can also see holes 
in the line, right? Whereas when it was small, you couldn't see holes. This is the idea of mechanically gated channel. The more stretch there is, the more it's open and the more the ion or whatever's going through it can get through. We also have carriers. These are different from channels. A channel is just a tunnel through the membrane. A carrier is a little bit different. Let's say this green line represents the membrane. A carrier is more like a revolving door. So maybe we can draw it like this. Example of this would be um, like a glucose transporter, GLUT4, for example, that lets glucose into skeletal muscle. Along comes glucose and it binds to one side and like a revolving door this triggers a conformational shape change in the protein such that now it's open on the other side and the glucose is free to go in. Now please recognize this is still passive diffusion. It's high to low and it doesn't cost any energy. As a simple rule of thumb Channels are associated with small things like ions or water, and carriers are required to move bigger things. All right, now let's quickly just wrap it up with active transport. As a quick reminder, we know that this one, the direction is low to high, and this costs energy. This is how we are going to break it down, depending on what energy costs there are. So in the first one, we have primary active transport. In the other one, we have secondary. Now, for primary active transport, this uses ATP. And the one thing that I think is, is important, the purpose of primary active transport is to create gradients. We defined gradients previously, and we understand now that gradients are important for, for um, the passive uh, diffusion to happen. So creating those gradients is critical, and that's what primary active transport is for. Secondary active transport is a little bit different. Secondary active transport uses what I like to call gradient energy. And we'll clarify what that means in just a minute. One of the other characteristics of secondary active transport is that it's always co-transport. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, there's always two different things moving at the same time. One of them using gradient energy, potential energy stored in the other, to go against the concentration gradient. So um, there, there's two types. If both things are moving in the same direction, as we see here, then we call it symport. But if they're moving in opposite directions, as we see here with these two arrows, then we call it antiport. Now, let's see if we can get some examples of this real fast. To start this thought experiment off, let's, let's have eight black dots on the top, eight black dots on the bottom. There is no gradient for black dots. But we do have some red dots on the bottom at a higher concentration than what we see on the top. However, our goal is to move all the red dots from the top to the bottom. Okay? To show an example of both primary active transport and secondary active transport and how they work together, let's first create a gradient. Remember, that's what primary active transport is for. We're going to create a gradient. So in this scenario, we want to run right here. We're going to write ATP right in the middle. We know that it's using ATP and it's a primary active transport. And this is my sodium potassium pump. Okay, let's, let's label that. Sodium potassium pump. 
And the sodium potassium pump has a very important job. It's going to pump three, let's go the other direction, three sodium out and two potassium in. Now we're not showing in this, in this simple scenario potassium and sodium. We're just showing black dots. But let's say these black dots are sodium. Okay, and we're going to run this thing to pump all the sodium out of the cell. So by running this, we end up with all of these black dots out here. Now we have a very strong gradient for sodium, high to low, top to bottom. We just created a gradient. Well, can we use that gradient? the potential energy stored in that gradient to move these red dots? And, and the answer is yes. We know what's going to happen if we open up a channel, a facilitator for these black dots to move. We know, based on stochastic odds, that these black dots are going to go into the cell. So let's take advantage of that. Let's create a co-transporter, in this case a symporter. Maybe it looks something like that where it's got binding sites for three black dots. That's how much it's going to require to get me to move this thing. But it's also got a binding site for one of these red dots. Now, it's co-transport. These things are going at the same time. And because there's three black dots that really want to get inside the cell, this triggers the conformational shape change required to open this up on the other side out comes the three sodiums. Of course, they're just going to get pumped right back out through the sodium potassium pump. But I was able to move that red dot against its gradient. That's the idea of secondary active transport. And we saw the potential energy stored in the gradient. That gradient energy is what allowed me to do it.